I think rabies is one of the most feared diseases uh, that we have. Uh, people are generally aware of rabies, but they're not necessarily aware of where the current threat is. And I think it's very important that the message gets out that rabies is in fact in wildlife populations. And you have conflict between people and wildlife and wildlife and pets, where you're, the interface for rabies is right now is between wildlife and your pets and livestock primarily. And uh, we've seen a real shift over the last, oh, 20 or 30 years where wildlife populations are coming in closer proximity to people where we have what we call invigorated species, those species that do better in environments that are altered by humans. So you get higher densities of things like raccoons and skunks and even coyotes now at where you have them showing up in the backyard in greater numbers and you're getting that conflict uh, right in your own backyard with a, a very common wildlife that people see on a regular basis. And I think it's important that the message gets out that those animals while are part of the natural community, can also pose a threat in certain situations, and there's ways to mitigate that. Well, in the U.S., the major source of rabies is carnivores and bats. Uh, the primary carnivores are raccoon, gray fox, skunk, and coyote. And there are several variants of uh, rabies virus in bats, so those are the predominant species that uh, the virus is reservoired into. In excess of 90% of all cases reported annually to the CDC are in wildlife. Well, wildlife rabies, uh, the control of it and prevention of it, and really leading maybe to elimination if it is in a population, is extremely important because our populations are so increased today over what they were uh, during the period of uh, actively taking wildlife for furs or for uh, sport. And so our populations have just become extremely uh, involved and so they are the next group that challenge our public and uh, they challenge it directly but they can also challenge it through unvaccinated uh, dogs and cats or pets. Oral rabies vaccination uh, involves the distribution of millions of baits and this is done mostly by air. The aircraft are equipped with GPS units and baits are distributed at prescribed densities along flight lines. But in some areas where there's where people uh, human densities are high along uh, urban suburban areas, we distribute baits by hand, and occasionally we target specific areas with helicopters as well. The baits that are used today are predominantly the coated sachet, which is a plastic uh, ketchup-like uh, container, and it has fish meal crumbs to attract the animal on the outside. And so, when the animal approaches a bait and bites into it, the vaccine is released and uh, the animal becomes vaccinated. The current program that we have to uh, vaccinate and protect wildlife from rabies and to prevent the spread of rabies, of certain rabies strains in the United States has shown to be very effective. Our, our goal is pretty straightforward. We want to protect people, we want to protect pets, and we want to protect livestock. But we also want to try to reduce the cost associated with certain rabies, terrestrial rabies strains from spreading from their current geographic location to, uh, in some cases, right across the United States where they've never occurred before. I believe it's extremely important to fund the uh, oral rabies vaccination programs. We've learned a lot. Uh, I think we've gone a long ways. We've had pitfalls but we're getting smarter. Uh, there's new vaccines that are being developed in baits that I think are even going to be more efficient. And with further funding, uh, we can take what we've gained now to keep this from going uh, to the Midwest or going into another country, uh, and uh, basically, I think, hold it, but more efficiently, I think we could eliminate it. Uh, with uh, at least quite a bit more funding. While oral rabies vaccination has grown in importance and has, has been proven to be effective in, in many areas, uh, we cannot forget traditional rabies prevention and control measures and their importance. They're very instrumental in, in preventing rabies, such as pet vaccinations or uh, not feeding wildlife to draw uh, animals in close, uh, increase the potential of, of exposure to rabies. I think the wildlife rabies management program in the United States that involves uh, 
a lot of different cooperators and a lot of different people uh, ranging from universities to the federal government to the state government put a lot of energy into making this program work and so far it's been very effective in meeting its number one goal which is to stop the further spread of certain rabies strains in the United States the raccoon strain in the eastern United States and the fox and the coyote strain in Texas that's been very very positive the consequences of stopping the program now is that we would see, potentially see, the spread of these strains go from a relatively small geographic area, in the case of Texas, coyotes and, and foxes, and a, 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 at least most of the eastern United States of the, of the raccoon strain, spread to much larger geographic areas. Once that happens, a whole new set of communities that haven't had to deal with that before are now going to have to deal with the rabies strain that they haven't had to deal with. And that costs money. That costs energy, time, both public agencies as well as individuals' time. And I think the program as it currently exists is shown to be effective. And as long as we can keep this program going and we can keep learning uh, new ideas and new ways of doing um, and tackling this problem, I think uh, we're, we're going to be able to prevent that additional cost to the public. Um, and we're going to look down the road to eventually move from not only stopping the spread, but one day eliminating rabies, uh, terrestrial rabies in the United States.